lift up your hands. First of all, I bring you greetings from my home church, Constantia Park Baptist Church. They send their greetings, and we have a lot in common. It's quite interesting. Pastor Martin Holt would minister here and administered at Constantia Park, and the same for Brian Stone. And now your new pastor served his internship with us. So we feel quite part of you, and we pray for your new year. This morning I'd like us to focus our attention on the chapter that was read. Shame, I'm sorry for the reader, it's not the easiest to read. But we're going to look at the whole book, but obviously we can't go into detail. But if you open your Bibles, you'll benefit more by following the verses as we get to them. Most of us know uh, the book of Isaiah as the Messiah or the Christ. And we know about the suffering of the Messiah, that famous chapter, Isaiah, chapter 53. He was despised and rejected by men. And then also the promise of the coming of the Messiah, that he would be born of a virgin. But this morning our focus is on chapter 45, where there's the promise of help and deliverance for the Jews in captivity in Babylon fitting in well with the children's talk. Remember the Jews were taken captive after Jerusalem had been destroyed. They were taken to Babylon. And chapter 45 contains a prophecy uttered about 150 years before the event took place. And it's a prophecy that was perfectly fulfilled and is still being fulfilled today. I think we need to also constantly remind ourselves that the Bible you have in your hands is got, and if we read Isaiah 45, we're reading a document of 2,700 years. And only since the invention of printing have people, ordinary churchgoers like you and I, been able to have a copy of the Bible to ourselves. Literally, for thousands of years, people had to depend on the synagogue or on the one copy of of the text in the church. And I think it's something we forget, and we need to appreciate our Bibles and the many translations we have. And so, there are many important lessons for us in this chapter 45, in this prophecy. And I'm using the ESV. It's just slightly different to the the NIV. But the chapter begins with a prophecy about Cyrus, a pagan Persian king. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob, I call you by name, though you do not know me. Now, who was this man, Cyrus, called the Lord's anointed, and yet he didn't know God? The last of the tribes of Israel were taken into captivity from about the year 600 BC. They included well-known figures like Daniel, we heard of about this morning. And a few years later, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, destroyed Solomon's temple, that lovely temple that they had waited so long for. And it was raised to the ground. And so was Jerusalem, the great holy city was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And the international politics of the day in the newspapers or however they communicated with each other in terms of news, clay tablets, by word of mouth, everyone thought that this great Babylonian empire would last for many years. It was the superpower of the world. And everyone had great respect for it. It was regarded as the largest city in the world. It was fortified. 
It had very high walls and very wide walls. You could drive chariots on the walls. But God had other plans, plans no one could ever imagine that the Persians would become the next great empire and that the, this Persian king who would lead the conquest of Babylon was the Cyrus of whom Isaiah speaks in verse 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. And literally overnight, in the end of October 539 BC, just over 2,500 years ago, the great Babylonian empire was had collapsed. The king, king at that time, was having an enormous party for a thousand guests and they were using the utensils that Nebuchadnezzar had, had broke, brought back to Babylon after he destroyed Jerusalem. And so they were using them as party utensils. There were about a thousand guests and then suddenly, in the midst of this great party, a hand appeared on the wall. In our English language, the writing is on the wall. It comes from here. I wonder how many people even know that. And a hand appeared and wrote on what was in. And Daniel is called to interpret the writing on the wall. And this is the interpretation. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. You have been weighed in the scales and found lacking. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And so literally, overnight, the great Babylonian empire collapsed. But all of this was for the good of God's people. Look at verse 4 of Isaiah 45. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I will call you by name, though you do not know me. And so God in his providence calls a pagan king to deliver his people from Babylon and to take them back to Jerusalem and Judah. It was like a second exodus. But this time there was no Moses or Joshua, but they were led by a Persian king who did not believe in God. And the part of God's purpose in doing this, we see in verse 6, Isaiah 45, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none other. And so God used this Cyrus to take his people back to Jerusalem so that all the nations of the day might know that Israel's God was at work and that eventually from this repopulated Jerusalem, the gospel, the good news of the true Messiah would be taken to all nations. This is a reminder to us too, living in the 21st century. God is at work in history and the events of the day. We may not see it or understand it, but God is building his Israel, his church. But Isaiah also reminds us that in the history of the world, there will be times that it doesn't seem as if God is at work. God's people didn't take this plan of action. They didn't like it. They couldn't share Isaiah's enthusiasm. Who in verse 8 calls on the heavens and the skies to rejoice in sending showers of blessing. Shower, O heavens, from above and let the clouds down right righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. God's people of the day 
could not understand how God could use a pagan king to take them back to Israel, to Judah. Was, why was God going to work in such a way that seemed so strange to them? And through Isaiah, God rebukes his people. Verse 9, Woe to him who strives with him, who formed him, a pot among the earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forded, What are you making? Your work has no hands. The people questioned what God was doing. They even had the audacity to say that God's plan had no hands or handles. In other words, it won't work. The pagan king Cyrus could never be God's servant. And don't we often find ourselves in such situations? We cannot understand what God is doing. And at times, if we are honest, we complain about what God is doing. Remember the wedding at Cana? The wedding where the wine ran out? Mary tells Jesus about the problem. They have run out of wine. And all he seems to be doing is filling the large pots of, water, of clay with water. There seems to be no link to any wine. And so often we only see God, as it were, filling the pots with water. He seems to have forgotten about us and our problems. The people could find no link between God's purposes and Isaiah's prophecy. And graciously, God reminds them that he is in control and he encourages them to ask him about the future, but not to tell him what to do. Verse 11 of 45. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him, ask of me things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? He reminds them that he is the creator of all creation, and he is going to use Cyrus to carry out his plans. Verse 13, I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward. God will do something even more remarkable than that not only will Cyrus defeat the Babylonians, Cyrus himself will give instructions that God's people must go back to their land and rebuild the temple and the city, and Cyrus's government will even support this great restoration project. And in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we find the Jews back in the land, rebuilding the temple and the city, and the kings of Persia and the state coffers have been used to help in this great project. At times there were great problems, but in the end, the temple was rebuilt. Jerusalem again had a wall around it. Uh, in Ezra chapter 1 verse 2, we read what Cyrus says. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people may ask his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. The Cyrus was aware that he was carrying out God's principles. They believed the Persians were very had many gods, and so they saw the God of Israel as the God in Jerusalem. And so that wasn't all. Not only were the Jews to go back to Judah and Jerusalem, but Isaiah challenges the people to look even further into the future 
to something more astonishing. Look at verse 14. Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabaeans, you men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is with you, and there is no other, no God besides him. They, the Jews had to trust God much further than what they could see him. God's plan went far beyond simply returning to Judah and Jerusalem. God's plan of salvation will extend to all people, all nations, the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, and the other nations will come to faith in the only God. It was difficult enough for them to try and come to terms with the fact that Cyrus was going to take them back to Jerusalem. Now God tells them that other nations will come and worship and serve their God. For a Jew living in Isaiah's time was a, a very tall order to accept. And so Isaiah adds a fascinating comment in verse 15. Truly you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. A God who hides himself in ways that they cannot see or imagine. God is at work. God, as it were, were working where no one could really see what was going on. And in an amazing way, the small group of Jews and their descendants who returned to the promised land were kept under the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, so that at the appointed time, an earth-shattering event could take place. It even changed our calendars from B.C. to A.D. Galatians 4 verse 4 reminds us, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. The tragedy of the Babylonian exile of God's people and their return would eventually lead to the birth of the Messiah in Bethlehem as his death and as they promised where he would be born in Bethlehem and die in Jerusalem. The course of events that the people had great difficulty in understanding. And how often aren't we like the Jews in Isaiah's time? We easily see the immediate present and we lose sight of God's eternal plan. We need to learn to trust God further than we can see Him. He has promised that His church, His people, will never be destroyed. Here in verse 17, God promises His people, His church, everlasting into all eternity. Look at verse 17. But Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. And in his earthly ministry, Jesus again and again spoke of the mystery of the kingdom of God. We don't always see it growing, but it is growing. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of the seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a, a tree. And in Matthew 16, that great promise, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And then Isaiah brings the chapter to a close in a grand finale with an invitation to all nations and all people to worship the true God. Look at verse 20. 
Assemble yourselves and come draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot say. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told us long ago, was it not I, the Lord, and there is no other God beside me, a righteous God, and a saviour, and none beside me. Idolatry moves us, God to the edge or sideline of our lives. It puts something else in his place, and it gives something else the glory that is due to God. We no longer have wooden idols. Our idols are much more subtle. Materialism, celebrity cults, modern science, drugs, sport, and we still find the Babylonian gods of astrology. You know what the stars foretell in many of our magazines and papers. According to a survey carried out amongst United States adults in April 2022, more than a quarter of them said they believed in astrology. And then in verse 22, God extends his call to salvation to all, to the whole world. Look at verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. If you'd like to do a little bit of homework, you can go back to Isaiah 45 and you'll see this phrase, I am God and there is no other four times in the chapter. And it's interesting that it was through this verse that the well-known Charles Spurgeon was brought to faith in Christ. He was a restless, uncertain 16-year-old teenager and in the providence of God, a snowstorm led him to a Methodist chapel and the snowstorm also prevented the visiting preacher that day. And in Spurgeon's words, at last, a very thin-looking man, one of the congregation, a shoemaker or a tailor or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. He was uneducated, and he could do little more than repeat the words of his text as in the authorized version. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none. Beside. And this is still God's call today. Look at verse 31, 23. It, by myself I have sworn from my mouth, and, and I has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return or be revoked to all nations to turn to him and be saved. And then verse 23 ends with a triumphant call. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue swear allegiance. If you're familiar with Paul's writings, you will see that the Apostle Paul quotes this very verse in that remarkable passage dealing with our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is on every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is the Lord of Isaiah 45. And his call is a universal one. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. And it's intensely personal. Every knee, every tongue. He is the God of all history, directing and controlling the nations of the world for the good of his people. And he calls everyone everywhere to come to him for salvation, to give up their idols, to bow the knee and confess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the one and only God promises to be the Savior of all who believe and trust in him. So this remarkable chapter 45 of Isaiah takes us from the exile of the Jews in Babylon under a pagan Persian king to God's call for all people to be saved in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to remember that God is still at work in history at times. We may not easily understand how or what he is doing, but then the great climax will be when Christ comes again and every knee will bow to him. We need to be sure that our knees and our tongues have bowed to our Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? O oh Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this amazing prophecy and for its fulfillment in history. And we thank you that us Gentiles are included in this amazing plan and help us also to worship you and to serve you and to bow the knee before our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Him before thee.